This is the move. Just want to encourage you that this song actually just reminds us that mountains are still being moved by King Jesus. Strongholds are still being loosed. So I don't know what mountain you are faced with or what strongholds you have, but today the Lord is reminding us that He can still do that. He can still move those mountains and He can still break loose those strongholds. He can still heal that sickness, whatever disease that you are carrying or your family member is carrying our friend. Let us be reminded today that the same God who is, who was, and is to come, He can still heal that disease. So as we worship this next song, whatever it is, where you are, just give it to the Lord. And let us believe that He can still do it because He is a great and mighty God. A miracle maker, that's who He is. So if you are praying for a miracle this morning as we worship together, just believe God for that miracle. Miracle of healing, miracle of salvation, miracle of restoration within families. The Lord can still do it today, but let's just trust Him. He can break that addiction in the name of Jesus. He can heal that sickness in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is, let's give it to the Lord today. He's here to give us freedom. Hallelujah. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are moving in this place. We thank you, Lord, that every mountain is being moved. Strongholds are being loosed in Jesus' name. So God, we give you everything. We give you all our burden, Lord. We're saying, this is yours, Lord. Set us free. We receive the move of your spirit right here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. And mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. That wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. Giants are still God, we believe it. Yes, we can see it. The wonders are still what you do. We are here. And we 
this moment, let's just speak to our Father. He knows what you need. Just this morning, just like worship Him and lift up your hands and tell Him, thank you, Lord, that you are moving in my life. You are moving in my family. You are moving in my workplace. Oh God, you are moving even in my body. I believe that you can still heal me, Lord. You can still heal my blood issue that the doctor has told me about. Thank you, God, that you are still a healer. You never change. You are still, re you remain the same. Your word, oh God, is what I'm just gonna fix my eyes on. You're moving in this place, Lord. You're moving in this place, Lord. You're moving in this place, Lord. I take part of it, Lord. I humbly, I humbly stay in your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh. Lord, we thank you for the healing that is taking place right now in this place, and we receive your healing. Thank you, Lord, for the restoration, Father, that is taking place right now. We receive in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are mending broken families, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you are doing something new in our lives, Lord, that will give glory and honor to you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you are moving and setting us free, Lord, from all kind of bondage in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that addiction is being broken in the name of Jesus. We receive freedom, Jesus, that comes from you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we glorify you, God. We give you the highest praise in Jesus' name. Amen. May we just appreciate the King of Kings and the clap of hands this morning. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Can we please take our seats? And can I encourage you to remain in this atmosphere of worship as we prepare to give our tithes and offerings? I often believe that as human beings, we don't really understand that the price that the Lord had to pay to have us into eternity. And in John 3 verse 16, the scripture reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. And perhaps this scripture is a reminder um, and in consideration of what it means to give as the Lord demonstrates what it means to give by giving us his only begotten son that you and I may have a place in eternity and as you consider that 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 reading from the Amplified Version says and God is able to make all grace every favor on earth earthly blessings come in abundance to you so that you may always under all circumstances regardless of the need have complete sufficiency in everything being completely self-sufficient in him and have abundance for every good work and act and i believe that scriptures for us this morning as we prepare to give to the lord um, a portion of what he has given us um, that we may do so in an act of worship and Galatians 6 verse 9 says, Let us not grow weary of becoming or become discouraged in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap if we do not give in. And my prayer this morning is that we do not uh, grow weary of doing good. That we may at all times worship the Lord and acknowledge Him for what He has sacrificed for us. Let us pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank You that You continue to choose us today. And thank you, Lord, that you prepared a place for us in eternity. And help us understand, Lord, the price that you paid for us to have a place in eternity. And Lord, this morning we do so as an act of worship, giving back a portion of our substance um, as an act of worship. We pray, Lord, that you may continue to bless one, each and every one of us this morning, that, Father, we may continue to trust you, that you continue to provide, that you become Jehovah Jireh, in our lives and we may live a life that glorifies you in jesus name we pray amen
gates of heaven let him reign Lord we pray that you open your flat gates of heaven over our nation Hallelujah. at this moment Lord as a church we want to lift our entire nation to you Lord we pray God that you cover this nation may you be Lord of Lords King of Kings over this beautiful nation Father we pray God that you cover this nation with your love with your peace in the name of Jesus we plead your blood all over the regions of this nation in Jesus name we know for the God that you are king of kings and you are lord above all may you reign over this nation father in Jesus name we pray amen amen and father we pray for the tithes and offering this morning i pray for wisdom for grace and for courage to abound in this house in Jesus name amen um this morning i'll share a couple of announcements before we go into the word um the first we have celebrate recovery celebrate recovery is a phenomenal cause um that is run here at Potter's World Church um and is run by Bevan um it's for those who are struggling with hurts um hang ups um and pain and this is a very encouraging cause that we strongly encourage for all of us to consider and there's a short testimonial clip that I'd like you to watch I had to control everything. I had to control it from beginning to end. I had to be able to manipulate it. I was having a hard time moving forward. Um, I was um, paralyzed by a lot of fears. I was going through the motions as a Christian, but not being the Christian. The real Denise had some ugliness in her, some things about myself that I didn't even want to know because I'd buried so deep. A lot of people have the misconception now that it's a drug and alcohol program and uh, that's where those people go. It's so much more than that. The people that come through Celebrate Recovery, the majority of them are Christian. They love the Lord, but they don't know how to handle these hurts, these bad habits and hang-ups. I still had pride issues. I was still a people pleaser. I still was more concerned with what other people may think in opposed to what God would do. In the past, I've struggled with many different types of sin, anger, codependency, looking at the wrong thing on the internet, self-abuse, cutting, it could be self-hatred, um eating disorders is huge. We have times in our life where we feel out of control. Is there any hope for me? Or is this it? Is this as good as it's going to get? The celebrate recovery meeting is where I really feel that I get spiritually connected because I know I'm entering into a place where there's no judgment. You work on whatever those hurt habits and hang-ups that you may have, you have a chance to work on them in an in an isolated situation. We've seen people who came in that were so broken, so down, so hurt, and to watch the transformation is just remarkable. You're here because God has led you here. and the message he wants you to receive tonight has everything to do with the hope that he wants to put in your heart. I had all these walls up. I wasn't letting anyone in. I was fearful. The Lord just surrounded me with a small group of people that would not stop loving me, and it was different for me, but I allowed it. That hole in my heart was being filled with something pure and holy. I'll never ever forget that. And slowly but surely, over this four-year period, I have worked on my spiritual principles, the things that allow me today to be a better person, a better father, a better husband. What Celebrate Recovery allowed me to do is deal with that person in the mirror and become the type of Christian that God wanted me to become. We know for a fact you can have victory because we're experiencing it ourselves every day. And as you can tell, this is an international program, and we have the privilege and the honor of serving our nation with this. Um, so it's a real blessing. So the course kicks off um, on the sixth of May, and we encourage um, that if you want to uh, register for the course, you can contact Bevan. Details I think are on the screens or in Cynthia, 
And if not, there's a sign-up registration table outside in the foyer. You can get um, to do so in those areas. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you to thrive and pursue God first. Okay, the next annou announcement is um, our Potter's Will Life groups, and that those are the groups that meet here on a Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. are currently on pause for the month of April. Um, we will resume those groups with a soaking service on the 8th of May, and we look forward to that. And exciting news, we have some baptisms in after the second service, so we encourage you to join us if you can um, as we uh, witness our brothers and sisters taking this important step. And with that, can you please uh, help me welcome Pastor Kevin as he comes and shares today's word. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for Pastor Kevin. We pray your anointing over him this morning as he shares your word. We give you honor and glory, Lord, for what you have given him to share with us today. We pray that you open our hearts to receive um, and not just be he uh, hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Uh, Pastor Kurt and Pastor Wendy are in Cape Town uh, celebrating Wendy's mother's 80th birthday. So if you could be praying for them, amen. <laughs> Such a blessing to have wisdom from the other generation for the older. I think I'm qualifying now for the older generation. <laughs> Can I ask us just to pause and pray? I don't know if you saw the international news with um, Iran attacking Israel last night with over 200 uh, cruise missiles and um, drones and uh, jets, and uh, there's been some form of defense, but uh, I think it's important for us as a, as a body of Christ to be praying. You, the Lord tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray for Israel, but I want to put it to you that God has also called us to pray for Iran. It's really important to recognize that in Israel there are many unbelievers and in, in, in uh, Iran there are many unbelievers too. And, and we need to pray that the church of Jesus Christ will reach the lost because hurting people hurt people. So can I ask if we could close our eyes and just pray. Father, we come before you with this troubling news of war coming in the Middle East and growing in the Middle East. We pray protection and peace over Jerusalem. You said we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for revival in Israel, Father. We pray for your protection over the people of Israel, that they would turn to you and seek your gift of repentance, Lord, that they would seek your presence, your guidance, your wisdom, that Israel would become a nation that honors you first and foremost in all that they do. And Lord, we lift up Iran and we thank you that the church is growing fast in Iran. And we lift up the church. We ask that there would be a revival in Iran, Father, that hearts would turn to you, hearts would repent and come to you as Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, as the body of Christ, that you would allow your peace, your grace, the revelation of your truth to unfold in Iran, in Jesus' name. And Father, we recognize that Ezekiel 37 is coming out, Ezekiel 38, 39 is being played out in front of our eyes right now. We see Scripture coming alive, and we thank you that we can see it, but we ask you to help us to pray in accordance with your Spirit and not in accordance with our flesh, in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that prayer, can you say amen? amen. We're in this series called God's Empowering Presence. We're in this series because we believe that God has said that He's going to allow, empower us with His Spirit. His Word of God says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will not abandon you. He, he has given His Holy Spirit to reveal the mind of Christ, to teach us, to counsel us, to guide us, to comfort us. And we need to be sensitive to God's empowering presence. We need to be sensitive to His presence. And for those of you who weren't here, I shared about how, uh, two weeks ago, I shared about how um, such a privilege for Helen and I to have seen Joshua and Caroline, his wife, and uh, have their daughter, our granddaughter. We are grandparents now. <laughs> and uh, it was such a privileged moment to see uh, their daughter, our granddaughter. Such a gift of life. I think many of us take for granted the gift of life that's in us. And um, there's this one moment, uh, four o'clock in the morning because of time differences, I was uh, in, the, in the lounge 
up and about, wide up and praying. And um, Joshua was there too, looking after his baby so proudly. She was uh, three, four weeks at that time, just holding her, his baby. And, and the baby uh, at that time is going through this um, series of drinking milk, needing a nappy change, sleeping, drinking milk, needing a nappy change, sleeping. And so he puts uh, Stevie Joy on the uh, table to change the nappy, and he starts singing over this uh, beautiful baby as he's changing the nappy. And there's this revelation that I shared with you as a church that I would like you to get again this morning. Father God sings over us. Zephaniah says he sings over us. Folks, even when we've got a dirty nappy, He's cleansing us with the water of his word and with the blood of the lamb. He loves us so much that even when we've got a dirty nappy, even when things have gone wrong, even when things are really messy, when life is messy, when stuff happens, it doesn't stop God from loving you. Just as I saw Joshua singing over his child, I would like that picture to stick in our mind. God really loves you. He gave his only begotten son for you when you're dead in sin. Whilst you're in that dirty nappy, he gave his son that you might have life, that you might have abundant life, that you might have Zoe life, that you might receive his spirit and be led by his spirit. So can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you with joy. Can you say to them, God really loves you? And don't mention the dirty nappy. Just, just leave it at that. How many of you feel like you had a dirty nappy this week? Just put up your hand if you, come on, a few, few more. Okay, only a few of us, right. Let me get this picture. God loves you. He sings over you. He hasn't given up on you. Love never gives up on you. And I'd like to take you to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Simon Peter, bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he addresses, to those who have obtained like precious faith, with us, by the righteousness of God and Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, he's addressing this letter to you and to me. He's addressing it to the people who have received salvation from Jesus Christ. If you are born again, this letter is relevant to you. And then he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you, not just grace and peace be given to you, but grace and peace be multiplied to you. Do you you see how God wants to give you not just grace, but multiplied grace, multiplied peace, multiplied joy. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Look at the key. In the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's this knowledge of God, knowledge of his heart, knowledge of experiential knowledge of who he is and his promises and plans for you. And he continues and he says, as his divine power has given, can you say with me, has given. given. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us by glory and by virtue. And then he continues, by which we've been given to us exceedingly great, not just great, exceedingly great, and precious promises, not just promises, precious promises, exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So here he says that God has given us exceedingly great and precious promises, has given us. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel like I've had revelation of those promises and those exceedingly great, precious promises. Sometimes it feels like, yo, I could do with a revelation of those precious promises. I could do with understanding of those precious promises because when you've been squeezed, it feels like I don't have them. And I feel so ill-prepared. I feel... Like, I need greater understanding, greater revelation, greater training, greater experiences to understand really the promises God has for us. But consider this for a moment. Jesus himself, in John 5, 19, he says, 
the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. So, so there's this picture that Jesus himself said, the Son can do nothing, the Son of Man. He, remember, Jesus is fully God and fully man. The Son can do nothing, Son of Man can do nothing by himself. And there's this revelation that you, you and I can do nothing by ourselves. Even Jesus, he could do nothing by himself. Son of man can do nothing by himself. He could only do what he saw the Father do and say what he heard the Father say. So there's this partnership that Jesus has with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit who's on Jesus, in Jesus. There's this partnership of Father speaking to Son, Son speaking to Spirit, Spirit speaking to Father. There's this partnership that goes on, this relationship that God calls us into this same relationship. But the problem is, it's through the knowledge. The key is through the knowledge of Father God. It's this experiential relationship with Father God. And so I want to put it to you that all of us need to grow our character. And the title of this message in empowering, God's empowering presence is Growing our character. How many of you admit your spouse needs to grow in character? <laughs> Don't put up your hands. <laughs> Helen will be the first one. I, I, I want to tell you that I believe that God wants our character to grow. Growing our character. Because growing our character in the presence of God gets us to the place of revelation of who Father God is. Stevie Joy, our granddaughter, is so small. She's so beautiful. She's lying there looking at her father as her father sings over, as Joshua sings over. She's looking at her father, just trusting the father, but not really knowing his heart or his mind or his will. Just trusting. And God would have us not only just trust Father God, but know him too through the knowledge of him. And so I would like you to know three points, main points today as we consider God's empowering presence in growing our character. First of all, God wants us empowered. God wants us empowered. God really wants us empowered. Remember, he said, Jesus himself said, I'll not leave you as orphans. I will not abandon you. I'll pray the Father and he'll give you another helper just like me. And that helper will be with you. And it's a picture of a, a hand in a glove. The Holy Spirit will clothe us, just like the Holy Spirit clothed Gideon, just like the Holy Spirit clothed Samson, except the Holy Spirit lifted off Gideon, the Holy Spirit lifted off Samson. The promise from Jesus is he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you forever. So the Holy Spirit comes and he, he fills us, he clothes us, and he will not leave us as orphans. And this this Holy Spirit, the third person of God, the Word of God tells us that He will be our helper, our teacher, our counselor, our comforter, and our guide. He will teach us and take us into all truth. He'll point us to Christ. He'll reveal the mind of Christ. And when Jesus died through crucifixion, the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. It was the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. The third person of God raised Christ from the dead. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you and I. Let me say it again. God wants you empowered. God wants us empowered. But most of us are probably sitting in the room and saying, but, but I've got such a big dirty nappy. I have messed up so much. How can God empower me? Because my character doesn't yet align with God's character. Therefore, I'm not qualified to... And, and there, many people will look on at the church and say, mm, but you know, that person's in such fraud. That person's so corrupt. That person speaks so badly. That person behaves so badly. And that person drinks so much. And that person has so many bad relationships. How can God use him? And now let's be honest, please. How many of you thought like that before? Just put up your hands. Oh, only, okay. And, and, and the problem when you do that to others, the same way that you judge, you shall be judged. And, and so what happens is we tend to think, hey, how can God use those people? But Internally, what actually is happening is how can God use me? 
And as I say that, I want to ask you a question that I want you to chew on. Which is a bigger sin? To grieve the Holy Spirit or to quench the Holy Spirit? Which is the bigger sin? Think about it for a moment. To grieve the Holy Spirit or to quench the Holy Spirit? Because the Bible tell us, tells us in Ephesians 4 verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, it's interesting, grieving the Holy Spirit, he aligns to immediately, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with, with malice. Put it away. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. The very next verse, he says, do not despise prophecies. Tell your neighbor, do not despise prophecies. Let me share the difference between grieving the Holy Spirit and quenching the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we sin, when we live with wrong activity. For example, selfish ambition. For example, when we're corrupt. For example, when we have evil speaking, when we defame people, when we gossip people. That grieves the Holy Spirit. When we partner with active sin, that grieves the Holy Spirit. And the Lord says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Quenching the Holy Spirit, imagine this, we quench the Holy Spirit when we fail to cooperate with the move of the Spirit, with the power of God. So let's say prophecy is, is happening, and, and, and so if it's of the Lord and prophecy is happening, we, re we quench the Holy Spirit and we say, no, 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 that, that prophecy is not, not from not from the Lord. We, we quench the Holy Spirit. When, when someone is being healed and we say, ah, that's not of the Lord, uh, there's no such thing as healings, that's quenching the Holy Spirit. If it's of the Lord, it's quenching the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit with, when we actively sin, when we go into wrong activity against the Lord. We quench the Holy Spirit when we fail to cooperate with His divine activity. So imagine a person who's got two legs, and the best way to walk is to have two legs. Amen? If you agree with me, if you've got two legs, that's the best way to walk, is to walk with the two legs. It's hard to walk with, properly with one, isn't it? You, you've got to compensate. But, but if you can imagine the walk, when the Lord says, those who are led by the Spirit, He says, walk in the Spirit. Well, when you walk in the Spirit, we need to walk on the two legs. And the one leg is character, and which is... Uh, the, allowing ourselves to partner with the, the Holy Spirit, allowing ourselves to let the Holy Spirit work on our character. But the other one is also the power of God, that we walk in the Spirit of God, that we're led by the Spirit. We, we allow the power of God to work in our lives, to work on our hearts, to minister to us and through us. Some people would say, hey, we have to wait until our character is right before God can use us. How many have thought that? I need to wait and sort some things out before God can use me. Just put up your hands. Can I just ask you the question? It's a tough question because I've also been there and then the Lord challenged me with this. Who gives you the right to determine when God can use you or not? When Jesus called people to lay hands on the sick and to pray. He didn't say, go and fix up your lives first and make it right and now go. He said, pray. Tell your neighbor, pray. pray. He doesn't say, who qualifies to pray and who doesn't pray. He called you the royal priesthood. He called you the saints. He called you to be ambassadors. He didn't say, fix up your life and you'll be an ambassador. He says, if you receive Jesus Christ by grace, and you receive the Holy Spirit by grace, I want you to do the following thing. Pray. Tell your neighbor, pray. pray. So who are you to say, hey, I can't pray for this person because I've got a sin in my life. When he took the disciples, <laughs> they were far from ready. The disciples were a messed up bunch of people. They were rough and tough fishermen. There was a tax collector there that had, had ripped off people in his life. And yet God calls them. There was doubting Thomas who doubted God. But their lives were far from perfect. Hey, there were two of them that were called the sons of thunder. Do you think that they had a temper problem? Hey, they, they had some issues. Hey, when, 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 <laughs> when God called them to pray for someone, they said, hey, Lord, I'm asking you now that you 
call lightning down and strike these people in Jesus' name. He wants them struck. It wasn't the love of God, but still God worked with them. And so who gives us the right to determine when God can use us and when God cannot use us? It's God who calls us by grace, and he calls us to understand. He calls us to work on character and allowing the power gifts to flow by grace. I remember as a young Christian called into ministry, and I, I was going up to Msunduza, and uh, I was going up to help Pastor Jackson and Plunga in Msunduza. He had found a place in Msunduza on the rough side where there was a shabin. And uh, so he was ministering just outside of the Shabin, about five meters from the Shabin. He was standing there and ministering. And there was hundreds of people standing there. So I went to help Pastor Jackson stand there. And Pastor Jackson and Mshanga had a really a special grace gift. When people came to, to be prayed by Pastor Jackson, they would line up in a long line and he would pray for them. And there was healings that happened. I, I hadn't seen healings as significant as that. It was amazing. I saw, the, I saw one person being caught pulled on a blanket, four people carrying the person on a blanket. He couldn't walk. He was down to a skeletal frame. They put him down and Jackson and Klanga came and he laid his hands upon him and prayed and prayed for mercy, prayed for grace. I watched this guy get up and walk away, healed in Jesus' name. Man, I was encouraged. My faith was built. And this went on for about four weeks. After four weeks, the crowds were getting bigger and I got up there for nine o'clock in the morning, one morning, uh, uh, to meet Jackson. There's a problem. Jackson didn't come. <laughs> hey, Lord. <laughs> and the people were coming because they'd heard that there was some healings going on. And I'm standing there. And I'm thinking, hey, Lord, you, you don't use me. You use Jackson. <laughs> And the Lord says, who are you to say that? You stand there. And uh, some of you know the story, but they, when it came time for praying, I've I, I got to be transparent and vulnerable. I was just praying, Lord, just some people with headaches, just some, some stomach aches, just make it easy on me, Lord. This is the first time. And the first person comes through is blind. I'm like, <laughs> Lord, hey, Margie, how can I pray for you? <laughs> May it be the headache, Lord. <laughs> she said, ah, oh, you can see I'm blind, please pray. Oh. So I pray and pray. Nothing happens. I'm devastated. The person moves to the side. She's devastated too. <laughs> the second person has this gouter, this huge gouter here. It's huge. I don't know if you've seen these gouters and it's slightly oozing here. And she's there, and I'm like, oh, Lord, please. And the Lord says, pray for her. And so I said, Margie, how do you want me to pray? Can I pray for stomach? No, no, pray for this. <laughs> hey, Lord, please. At this time, honestly, I'm in the place of saying, Lord, you know, it's your name. It's your reputation. I'm just a fool for you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to obey you because you said I have to do it, but I, I feel unqualified. I feel ill-prepared. And the Lord says, when you're weak, I am strong. When you're a fool, I can be wise. Now my faith is building. And I, the Lord says, put your hand on the gouter. Ha! Huh? Okay. <laughs> put the hand on the gouter, no problem. And I'm praying. I'm praying. And in the spirit, I see this gouter go. It's gone. I open my eyes. It's still there. <laughs> Hey, she moves aside. She's disappointed. And next person comes. Praise God she had a headache. Oh, thank you. I prayed for her so much. She was relieved of her headache. <laughs> anyway, the next day I came up there and I'm like, Lord, if no one comes at nine o'clock, it's, it's your fault. I did what I was supposed to do. If, at nine o'clock, there's no one there. I'm like, oh, oh, Lord. Okay. Ten past nine, the people started running. Half past nine, it was full. And half past nine, up comes this old lady with no glasses, nothing. She comes running. She comes and says, Mfundis, Mfundis. Hey, you know, you prayed for me yesterday. Nothing happened. But last night, in a dream, Jesus came to me. And Jesus put his hands on my eyes and said, be healed. I can see now. Wow. Yeah. 
the lady with the gout, she comes running a few minutes later, it's gone, it's like her baby's skin, it's completely healed. She says, in the night I had a dream, Jesus came and laid his hands. I'm sharing this with you to understand, that you can understand, who are you to say I'm not qualified? Because we're not qualified, we come by the righteousness of God, which is a gift of grace. Receive his righteousness. God, understand this. God wants you empowered. God wants you to hear from him and partner with him. Tell your neighbor, God wants you empowered. But in being empowered, please understand, there's two legs. There's the character of God. There's the power of God. And they work in the person according to how we allow the person of the Holy Spirit to work with our heart. So what God does and we don't like is God takes us on a journey. Tell your neighbor, God takes us on a journey. He uses the journey to work with our character. And some of us, we don't like the journey. Most of us, we've got such strong goals in mind. We are saying, we're very goal-oriented. Hey, I'm going to university to get a degree, uh, to get a job. Praise God, yes. I'm earning a salary in order to buy a car. Praise God, yes. But we've become so driven by the goal, we've forgotten the journey. We've forgotten that God is using the journey to train us, to get us to look at our own hearts. God uses the journey to reveal His character, to reveal His heart, to reveal His promises, to reveal His will. Listen to Matthew 4, verse 18. When Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, he says to the two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, they they were fishermen, he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. But listen to this again. Follow me, and I'll make you. He uses a journey to make us, to shape us, to expose in us the stuff. He uses a journey to train us. When you're standing in line and the person's being rude in front of you, he wants to train you through that. When somebody's driving and they've got AYM syndrome, angry young man syndrome, and they're driving, and they, God is using the journey to train us. When someone speaks to you rudely, God uses the journey to train us. It's not God who did that. But God takes what was meant for bad and he uses it for good. Even Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Scripture says Jesus learned obedience through suffering. So he doesn't want us to suffer, but he uses what was meant for bad for good. Jesus learned obedience. He had to learn too because he was fully man and fully God. And we see that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan He overcame Satan. He humiliated Satan. He took the keys of authority away from Satan. But even Jesus had to go on a journey. The Hebrews had to go on a journey. And as the Hebrews went on a journey from Egypt into the wilderness to the promised land, those 40 years is where God reveals his names, his promises, his plans, his heart. So count it all joy as you enter into various trials and tribulations. Right now, you might be going through trials and tribulations and you're worried about this dirty nappy, but God wants to turn the dirty nappy into a lesson for us to empower you. God wants you empowered, but God uses the journey. I I read a book given to me by a friend, Gary Skepers. He gave me this book, Christian Atheists. Say to your neighbor, Christian Atheists. It's an anomaly, isn't it? Christian atheist. How can you be a Christian atheist? But I I want to put it to you. It's written by Craig Rochelle. It's worth reading. There is such a thing as Christian atheists. Christian atheists are people who have received Jesus Christ as Savior, but not made him Lord. And so what happens when, when God says, hey, do this, they don't. When God says, pray for this person, no, no, God can't use me. When God says, bless, no, no, God can't bless through me. Christian atheists, where we don't take and apply the Word of God. And so God uses the journey, whether you're a Christian atheist, whether you're a Christian, whether you're an atheist, God uses the journey to prepare. So are you ready for the journey? Because 
enjoy the ride. So many of us are waiting until we turn this age or that age or waiting until we retire or waiting until we get the job or waiting until we get the money instead of enjoying, enjoying the moment. Having watched Joshua and Caroline have their beautiful baby, seeing them enjoy the moment is such a precious gift because there's parts of my life I look back and say, all I was doing was focused on the goal instead of enjoying the journey. Decide to enjoy the journey. You have a gift of life. Tell your neighbor, life is short. Eternity is real. People matter most. So will you enjoy the journey or are you going to be so goal-orientated you miss God's plan? I want to put it to you that Robert's, um, L- Robert Lewis said this, a real man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and looks for the greater reward, God's reward. I want to challenge us as a church to reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously, and look for the greater reward, God's reward. And what I mean by that is reject passivity by just focusing on the goal. Reject passivity of re- losing the moment, the time, the day, the hour. Enjoy the moment. Let God train us in this time. That's why Peter says, give all diligence. He doesn't say give diligence. He says, give all diligence. Make every effort. Be intentional to add to faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And when he talks about love, he's talking about agape love. In other words, God's got this goal that he wants us to be intentional, deliberate, and give all diligence to. To add to your faith. You've got faith. You've been given this gift of faith. Every one of us has been given a measure of faith. But he wants you to take you to moral excellence, to the knowledge of God, to perseverance. He, he wants to take you to godliness. He wants to take you to brotherly kindness, which is phileo love. And he wants to lead you to agape love because agape love is who he is, unconditional love. And, and can I put it to you? The reason why he wants you there is to recognize agape love, to be a vessel of agape love. I don't know if you know, but every single miracle of Jesus done was based on agape love. I mean, look at this for a moment. Look at the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew 14, verse 4. And when Jesus went out to see, out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them. The word compassion, he was moved by love and healed their sick. At the feeding of the 4,000 in Matthew 15, 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and he said, I have compassion on the multitude because they've continued with me three days and have had nothing to eat. And I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. Wow, Jesus knows when you're hungry. Jesus knows when you're hangry. And Jesus knows when you're going to faint. And Jesus cares. He knows all things. The Holy Spirit knows all things. And he's motivated by compassion. Look at this next miracle, the healing of the two blind men in in Matthew 20, verse 34. So Jesus had compassion on the blind men and touched their eyes. And immediately the eyes received sight and they followed him. He had compassion on them. Or the healing of the leper in Mark 1, 41. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched them. He says, I'm willing to clean you, be cleansed. What about the last one I just wanted to share with you is the, the demonic the possessed demonic in Gadara in Mark 5. However, Jesus didn't permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you by healing you of these demons. And look at this, and how he has had compassion on you. Jesus was motivated in every miracle by compassion. If you want to reflect, accurately reflect Jesus, We've got to go on the journey and allow the journey to heal of us of all our issues so that we can accurately reflect the love of God. He's not calling us to be perfect. He's calling us to be perfectly forgiven, but to be vessels of love. Look at uh, 2 Peter 1.8 for a moment. The scripture says, For if these things are yours, 
if you receive these precious promises, if you receive this word that I'm giving you, for if these things are yours, if you've taken them on board and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you accept that God wants you to be empowered, if you accept that God uses the journey, and the journey is to deal with these things, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful. God wants you to be fruitful. The key is in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't just want you to be empowered. Here's my last point. He has empowered you. Tell your neighbor, He has empowered you. He has given the precious promises. He has given you His Word. He has given you His Holy Spirit. God has empowered you. But some of us have got these beautiful promises of God, like gifts wrapped up, and never unwrapped them. I was reading a story about a man who is homeless and living underneath the bridge, and he, he died under the bridge. Do you know they, they found him, they took him uh, to the mortuary, and, and they, they opened his clothes because they have to, to try and find an ID. Do you know they found an envelope there with $28,500? I mean, we're talking 460,000 in Malingeni, in his pocket. So here he is, living underneath the bridge, and dies because he's cold, because he's starving. In his pocket is $28,500. I read a story of a, a young man who also died underneath the bridge, homeless. He had inherited $300 million. Never used it, lived under a bridge. Many of us have received the promises of God, the plans of God, the vision of God. Few of us open the promises and apply the promises. When, when the disciples came to Jesus, they, they, they didn't come and ask him for more power. They asked him, teach me how to pray. Because they knew that through the knowledge of Jesus comes the revelation of the promises. And so he teaches them to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And, and later in Romans 8.26, the Lord promises us, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, family, you have promises that even the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. Jesus intercedes for you. The Holy Spirit intercedes for you. And I've learned, myself personally, I've learned that to the measure I open up to allow the Holy Spirit to work on my heart, on my character, to the measure I allow the Holy Spirit to teach me about Father God, to the measure I allow the Holy Spirit to lead me, to that measure God empowers me. It requires a response. The Word of God says, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me. Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow out of them. So listen again, 2 Peter 1.18. For if these things are yours and abound, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For if these things are yours and you abound in these, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful. How? Through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. If, if, you, if you lack these promises, if you lack opening these presents, if you, if you lack allowing God to take you on this journey, if you reject the journey and you push back like a Christian atheist against what God is trying to do, if you lack these things, we're short-sighted even to blindness and we've forgotten that we've been cleansed from our sins. And so three points today. God wants us empowered. God uses the journey, and God has empowered us. And so I love the psalm that says, because of that, lift up your heads, O you gates, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, lift up, O you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. Can I invite the worship team up? And as they come up, I would like us to pause for a moment and 
Think about this question. Before the question, let's remember, God wants us empowered. He, he wants us empowered. Jesus gave up his life not just to forgive us and to cleanse us, although that would have been enough. Not just to give us eternal life, but Jesus gave up his life so that you would be empowered. He wants us empowered. He uses the journey. He has empowered us. But I would ask the question now, just heads bowed, eyes closed, across the room, how many of you would admit that you've grieved the Spirit? You've actively, knowingly sinned, knowing it's against the will of God, and therefore you feel unqualified. Just put up your hands. Those of you who know you've quenched the Holy Spirit, where you know the power of the Holy Spirit is moving, but you, you've rejected the power of the Holy Spirit moving, could I ask you just to put up your hand? Thank you. If you could pull your hands down now. Those of you who recognize that you haven't opened up the gifts that God has given you, the precious promises, haven't believed the promise of God for you, can you just put up your hand? Thank you. Just with your eyes closed, I remember a time I had this dream. This dream where God was doing supernatural things. And I woke up in the morning thinking, yo, that was an incredible dream. But it's only a dream. God couldn't do that. through me. And suddenly I realized I'd quenched the Spirit. Who am I to say God can't use me? God can't use that person. He uses the foolish things of this world to confuse the wise. He uses the weak things of this world to confuse the strong. And we need to recognize God wants you empowered. Even as you spat against him, as you reviled him, as we mocked him on the cross through our sin, he said, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He wants us empowered. He uses the journey. He has empowered us. Holy Spirit, we ask you for forgiveness, for grieving you. You tell us not to be corrupt, yet we've, been, we've fallen short of the glory. You tell us not to speak evilly, but we've spoken maliciously, wrongly. You tell us not to quench the Spirit, yet we've quenched the Spirit ask you for forgiveness and today we choose you that you're not just our saviour you are our Lord we come under your authority today we need a move of your spirit you do what you do Lord here we are to serve you Lord because there's nothing worth more that'll even come close to your heart of agape love, a love that never gives up, a love that endures all things. We offer our lives to you and we repent of being Christian atheists in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask you to stand this morning? And as you stand, I'm going to ask you not to rush out the door. I, I feel like God wants to do something very special in two waves. But before I do that, I want you to hear the heart of the Father. I speak His blessing of love over you in the name of Jesus the Christ. I speak the blessing of His peace over you. I speak the blessing of His joy over you. I ask the Lord to open your eyes to see His love, the heart 
the width, the depth of his love. I ask the Lord to show you that even if you've got a dirty nappy, he's standing over you and singing over you. He loves you. And he takes that nappy wipe and he just cleans of every spot, wrinkle and blemish in Jesus' name. But I need you to respond, or I believe the Lord is saying, respond this morning. Respond in the blessing. If you recognize you have grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit, I believe the Lord says, you need to man up. You need to reject passivity. You need to accept responsibility. You need to lead courageously. And you need to look for the greater good, God's reward. And I believe that God would have you kneel where you are, in front of your family, reject passivity, accept responsibility. In front of your family, kneel where you are or come to the altar and lead courageously because God wants you empowered, but he's going to use the journey even now to empower you. God bless you. Your glory, God, is what.
Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come and fill us, flood us. Thank you that we can repent of grieving and quenching you. And you forgive us, cleanse us. Here we are, we make ourselves available to you. Come and work on our hearts. Give us revelation. What you want to address in Jesus' name. I just sense there's somebody here who's battling. You've got this dream, this vision, and um, it, it's not working out. This goal that you've got is not working out, and you're frustrated because you don't understand because you, you believe God gave you that dream, that vision, and life isn't working out the way you thought it worked out because God gave you that vision and, and you feel conflicted right now and just trying to understand what's going on. And I, I feel like the Lord says, I gave Joseph a vision at 17 years old. But I had to take him first to the pit and then pot of his house and then the prison. And every time he honored me, it seemed like circumstances got worse and worse and worse and worse. But I used the journey to train hearts. And at the appointed time, Joseph was released from prison into the palace. And I believe the Lord is saying, don't make your palatial vision dream, your goal, your objective, your dream that I've given you, don't make that an idol. Somehow you've made that the idol. And God is saying, let me take you on the journey so I can deal with your stuff because you've got stuff. So I can wash you, clean you, prepare you, train you. Train you for the vision I truly have given you. So God is able to do more than you can ask, think, or even imagine. But then he says, according to the power that works in us. So will you let Him work on you? Will you lay down the idol of your goal? Lay down the idol of your dream? Lay down the idol of your vision and just realize it's God's. Now you walk where He leads you. And it feels like you get pulled off the main road onto a dirt road, onto a bumpy road, and it's a bad road. And you're trying to work out how does that line up let God take you on the journey. Keep focused on the Lord. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the people around you. He enjoys them. Enjoy God's word for you right now. Here's the word. Lay down the idol. It is an idol. And make Jesus Lord of your life. Trust Him. The vision will happen. It is for an appointed time. Though it shall tarry, it shall come. If you lay it down and let Jesus be your only love, your first love. Amen. I'm going to do the benediction now, but I'm going to ask for those of you who feel like you need a refreshment in the Holy Spirit, a filling in the Holy Spirit, if you need the laying on of hands right now because some of you I believe the Lord needs to encourage you the Lord's put his right hand upon you and, and I invite you just to come forward if you if you want the filling of the Holy Spirit the baptism of the Spirit if you want the stirring of the gifts please can I invite you as I've done the benediction just to come forward because the Lord talks about ministry through the laying on of hands in Jesus name then can you come to the front as we release people. In the meantime, you are the royal priesthood. You are his sons and daughters. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. God bless you.